the number 10 quarterback coach duo, Tony Dungy and Peyton Manning. Are there any bigger names in Indianapolis sports history than Peyton Manning and Tony Dungy? A lot of people you, you describe as oil and water. Uh, Tony Dungy and Peyton Manning you describe as water and more water. It was like two people competing to see who could be the most beige. They were not colorful. Peyton Manning was the kid that when they said, uh, all right, class, class dismissed, he was like, you forgot to assign homework. How am I supposed to learn? Peyton Manning and Jim Mora made good study partners, but eventually cracks developed in the relationship. 2001, there were a lot of interceptions because he was trying to force things there because of how bad this team was defensively. Throws deep middle, intercepted, 49ers pick it off. You can't turn the ball over five times like that. Holy crap, I don't know who the hell we think we are when we do something like that. Looking for change, the Colts dismissed the brash and welcomed the benevolent. He is humility personified. I mean, he is the Mr. Rogers of football. Tony Dungy led from a distance, which was perfect for Peyton. He leaves the offensive you know, coaching pretty much the same when he comes in Indianapolis, and he lets Peyton you know, continue to grow with people that he's used to. I'll give you my idea, and then you play with it. Do what you want. Okay, yeah. You do it the hell you want. Okay, all right. Okay. It wasn't like they were often in the room breaking down film together. And so, while Tony wasn't involved directly with the game plan for Peyton Manning, he did have an influence on Peyton Manning. He wasn't a guy that was a yeller, wasn't a guy that was a screamer, but he was a guy that would make sure you get the job done and a guy you did not want to let down. Together, Manning and Dungy became a match made in heaven. If you look at Peyton Manning's numbers from 2002 on, they got significantly better. Number 18's driving this machine like I've never seen. Tony Dungy was the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts for seven years. In all of those years, the Colts won at least 10 games. That 10-win season was his first season. The last six years they were together, they won at least 12 games in every year. We want to walk out of here with some humility. They walk out of here just the way we came in, knowing that we're a good team, uh, but knowing we're, we're still focused in on the mission ahead of us. And that just doesn't happen in the National Football League. Manning and Dungy made the list because despite staying in their own lane, they rode together to a championship. Steps up, steps up in the pocket, rolls away, throws one downfield, Reggie's there, got it to 20. Touchdown, Reggie Wayne! The Colts are world champions! World champions for the first time! The, the relationship between Peyton and Tony Dungy I'm glad they were on the list at 10 because it can easily be overlooked. The head coach runs everything. And that quarterback and head coach have to have that type of relationship, and Tony took the time to do that, and Peyton did the same. The number nine quarterback coach duo, Mike Holmgren and Brett Favre. This is like a blueprint for every head coach that needs to just tame this wild stallion of a quarterback. Now, are you all right? Yeah. No more rocket well, balls, please. Well, I was chained up. No, I know. You just had two leaders who had a very, very different approach to the workplace. Brett wanted to have fun on the field and off. I'm going to wear those for you. Hey, you got any left-handed football? You know what time the game starts? You think God never farted? And Holmgren was the exact opposite. Mike wanted control. Well, just someone tell me we can't make that block. I won't call the damn play, you know? How do you feel about getting your ass cut tomorrow? Remember, Holmgren had been a San Francisco 49ers guy. West Coast offense, very calculated, a ton of pre-snap reads. He came from a system that was so precisely defined. Brett Favre needed that because at the end of the day, you can't live in the NFL as a quarterback playing outside of structure, playing without a tactical awareness. Watching him growing up, immediately there was this burst of like, okay, we could actually be good again. And you saw these sort of sparks of it, and it was very exciting, but he would also break your heart. I mean, he would make these throws that nobody else could make. Uh, well, now comes to the end zone. In traffic. Oh, oh, I don't know. And then he would throw a pick that nobody else would try. Barb has time. Pops now throws in zone. Why doesn't we 
really have? Why didn't he? How many times did Brett Favre start to do something on the field where you could feel Mike Holmgren, you know, you could almost see steam coming out of his ears? Second down, 11. Oh. 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 And make the switch. Put in, a, put in the other quarterback. Come on. Ah, oh. uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Brett drove Mike crazy, but then he'd drive the Packers down the field for a game winner, and it was all good. He's going to throw it to the end zone. He's open. That's sharp. Wide open. Touchdown with 55 <laughs> seconds left. Mike Holmgren understood as he went along that the genius of Brett Favre was sometimes you just got to let Brett be Brett. Holmgren's investment in Favre would soon pay off. Just three seasons after leading the league in interceptions, the gunslinger would lead the Packers to their first Super Bowl in almost 30 years, becoming a three-time MVP along the way. It is going to be a touchdown to Andre Ryzen. The Vince Lombardi Trophy is coming home where it started. Adrenaline bumping a little. All right, you all right? I'm not. It's a tough place to get the ball. I know. I'm not. In Brett Favre's 20 seasons, only seven of them were with Mike Holmgren. If he's with Mike Holmgren for all 20, or even 12, 15, you're looking at two more Super Bowls, three more Super Bowls. You're looking at Brett Favre and his legacy even being greater than it was. Clearly, Favre was never the same after Holmgren left. They did so much together, obviously, but they only won one championship. They went to two Super Bowls. I just think if Holmgren had stuck around, they probably would have gotten higher on the list. The number eight quarterback coach duo, Marv Levy and Jim Kelly. Yeah, baby! Woo! You had a connection between those two, and, and think about it, with Jim Kelly, this was someone who actually didn't really want to go to the Buffalo Bills at first. Buffalo selects quarterback Jim Kelly, Miami of Florida. Honestly, uh, you know, I cried <laughs> pretty much, not uh, full-blown tears, but... Uh... The city just grew on him, and he grew on the city, and now they're forever linked. I think there's a certain amount of opposites attract. Marv is, uh, you know, Phi Beta Kappa, uh, guy that quotes uh, Churchill. I'm always quoting Winston Churchill, my favorite Winston Churchill quotes about a guy he doesn't like. He says, the guy's got uh, all the virtues I don't like and none of the vices I admire. <laughs> you know, Jim Kelly is somewhat more rough-hewn, Western Pennsylvania, shall we say. But then think about the connection between Marv Levy and Jim Kelly. And that K-Gun offense was so special and it really gave the Buffalo Bills quite the advantage. Number one, they played faster. Hurry it up, hurry it up, hurry it up, hurry. We better hurry. It's a, it's a passing game that was ahead of its time. Uh, and Marv Levy was the grand architect of that. Nowadays, we kind of take that kind of stuff for granted. No huddle and basically doing what the K-Gun did. But back then, I mean, that was something that was almost unheard of. If the Buffalo Bills are going to be this impressive on offense the entire football season, AFC beware. I think that Marv Levy understood what Jim Kelly was as a player. He was a guy that went out and played and played intuitively, instinctively. He was cocky. He had that uh, strut in there walk about him. The best part about it and the reason I'm in the Pro Football Hall of Fame is Coach Levy um, Put his job security on the line. He let me call the play. Touchdown! Unbelievable! Way to come back, guys. Way to hang in there. What will never get lost is four straight appearances in the Super Bowl. The mental resolve, I think, to be able to get back up and do it again and get back up and do it again. I don't know if people really truly understand what it takes to get that done. Jim Kelly and Marv Levy win at least one of the four Super Bowls that they lost. We're easily talking top five. Levy and Kelly, should he be a lot higher? They kind of revolutionized that coach-quarterback relationship. They were as great a duo as we have seen all time. The number seven quarterback-coach duo, Don Shula and Dan Marino. I was a kid in uh, 1984, I thought I knew all the toys. And then the Transformers came. And I was like, what, that 
forget all the rest of the toys. I, you know, Optimus Prime is now in my life. I think Don Shula got Optimus Prime. Could you imagine how much fun it must be to be a coach and all of a sudden this god comes. Touchdown! Probably the only god with a mullet. <laughs> Don Shula came from the crew cut era. Three yards in a cloud of dust was what won games. Ran the ball, ran the ball, ran the ball, ran the ball. It was run the ball, it was run the ball. Larry Zonka, Jim Kick, Mercury Morris. This is not Larry Zonka and Jim Kick and Mercury Morris. I have a quarterback who's absolutely special throwing the football. And then I'm gonna get Dan Marino. You throw the ball, you throw the ball. That's a smart coach. Totally revamped his philosophy and built a great team that went back to a Super Bowl throwing the ball all the time. Shula recognized that he had a truly special talent in Marino. Very few people threw the ball then or now like Dan Marino. Marino picked up the touchdown record and the yardage record, you know, under Shula. Those touchdown passes, 48. Shula used Marino's skill set. Those passes completed, 362. To a T. Marino was a quick release. Marino liked to spread the ball around. And Shula drew up offensive schemes that perfectly fit that. You didn't have time on Freddie there? That's just a sign of a great football coach that just knows to adjust to the people he has. The other thing that was really dope was that you were always open. Even if you don't think you're open, look for the ball. Dan will find a way. To get it in. Good job. You know, it reminds me of Ted Williams turning people and going, well, you just got to watch the spin on the ball as it's coming in, and that'll tell you if it's a curveball or a fastball. And people having to pull him aside and going, we're not superhuman. Right, like you are. We, we don't see what you see. Once he and I were exchanging, I said, well, now what are you looking at when the ball snapped? What are you looking at on your first read? When you look to your alternate receiver? He says, look, I just look for the open man, and I'm going to hit him. So I think, you know, Dan Marino saying something like that, you know, here's a guy whose brain and body work so much faster and in so much of a higher level than everybody else, he was able to say, I'm just gonna hit the guy who's open. The success that I think that Shula had with Marino is a, is a testimony to Marino's greatness, certainly, but Shula's willingness to let him be great. I think that as a coach, you have to be able to trust that. Coach Shula being mobbed as he becomes the all-time winningest coach. So why don't they rank higher? Shula and Dan Marino only made it to one Super Bowl, and together, they never won. It's not the fact that Shula and Marino never got to the Super Bowl again, it's the fact that they never got close. It's, it's forever gonna be a lingering what if. They were beautiful, they just didn't get it done. It's like I tell my wife, don't focus on the big thing at the end. Try to enjoy all the little stuff leading up to that. And don't worry so much if you don't get the thing at the end. That's not a big deal, right? How's that work for you? Oh, we're in marriage counseling. <laughs> the number six quarterback coach duo, Tom Landry and Roger Staubach. Of course, the nuts and bolts of the Dallas Cowboys is, uh... <clears throat> the man that wears a funny hat on the sidelines. Well, these are, are two of the all-time icons in the game. Together, Tom Landry and Roger Staubach won two Super Bowls. Kind of a match made in heaven. Landry in the fedora, you know, pacing the sidelines with a rolled up piece of paper. Here's a guy saying, uh, we don't have to play it like it's always been played, but I'm gonna dress like it's 1912. Staubach just came from the Navy, and he's kind of used to this discipline and very kind of stern type of atmosphere, and that is what Landry was. Out of the way, okay, that's the boy. Okay, you better be ready, I tell you, when you go through there, because he's gonna come. They were two people that meshed together perfectly. If you were to look up the word character in the dictionary, they should be standing next to each other. Uh, I think they were the perfect complement. And that's when they became America's team. They appear on television so often that their faces are as familiar to the public as presidents and movie stars. They are the Dallas Cowboys, America's team. Tom Landry wanted Salbach to just sit in the pocket and, and pass the football and get rid of the football and not get hit. Stahlbach is Stahlbach, Roger the Dodger. I'm aggressive uh, to a degree as a quarterback. 
Sawbuck did things his way on the football field sometimes. He didn't trust Roger Staubach. Didn't trust him because Roger had wheels. You should only leave the pocket out of sheer fright if you're a quarterback. You don't leave the pocket to try and create plays, extend plays, make plays. That's where you're going to get hurt. The offense breaks down. No one does that. And that was tough for Tom Landry to watch Roger Staubach do that. Staubach was the first black quarterback. He was the only, he was the first guy running around like a chicken with his neck cut off. Star, Starback was special. Roger Starback, very special. But Landry learned in time that the thing Staubach was not going to do, which was adhere to his playbook at all times, was mitigated by the things he was able to do outside of structure. Staubach drops back to pass, sets up, pass to Enzo, Landry still always respected Saulbach for, for the way he played the game and how much he wanted to win, and, and, it, and it worked. we we'll probably say Belichick and Brady, but my favorite was Tom Landry and uh, Roger the Dodger. Roger the Dodger. I like where they are on this list. I think that they deserve to be there. And now, the number five quarterback coach duo, Vince Lombardi and Bart Starr. To me, the numbers that leap out and what leaps out about this duo is the pure winning when it matters the most. The ball game's over and the Green Bay Packers have won the championship. The trophy's named after him, right? So I think we can start from there. And the Packers have just taken the championship. I think when you look at the postseason record, it's off the charts. They had one loss <laughs> together. Star dropping straight back. Hit as he throws. Has the ball. Seven championships. And this duo together goes nine and one in postseason play. How about that? We've never seen a many like this one. They were as dominant within their era as any pair that we're going to see on this list. Bart Starr, there was never a, a better quality human being on this earth. Every person that has been on our club through the years that was exposed to Coach Lombardi, when I tell you that we're better people for having been exposed to him. Lombardi didn't seem like a nice guy. What are you doing out there? This is a mean guy who gets the best out of his guys. I'll tell you something, Leroy, you're not going to get your job back unless we get a better performance. Ran his team with an iron fist, for sure. What the hell's going on out here? Anything you ever hear or read about Vince Lombardi, it's controlling. Huh. Well, your story is outside, not me. <laughs> Obviously, he knew how to push buttons. Let's go. Come on, dude. Come on, Travis. Get, get off and uncount me. Very rare that you think of him as someone who was giving control to any of his players. Uh, but that's what he did with Bart Starr. What happened at 68? I don't know. What the hell happened? I said it was against Zeke. It should have been great. Well, nobody happened. Nobody blocked on the left side. Marvin, you miss that guy every time. Vince Lombardi saw his ability, saw his leadership skills, and that's what Vince Lombardi was all about, was leadership. I also think that Starr might not get the credit he deserves because he did play in an offense that was handed off. Starr takes the ball, hands off to Honig. Snap of the ball, Paul Horning off the right side, cuts at the five, touchdown! Vince Lombardi and Bart Starr have to be put in the context of the times. It was the 1960s. The NFL in the 1960s was about three yards in a cloud of dust. And away to run it in The most important play we have is the play we must make go. It's the play that we will make go. It's the play that we will run again and again and again. And, you know, I think some of those games, I, I think the Packers would win like three to one and a half. So you had a coach with a really defined belief and a quarterback who was willing to do that. And that takes a lot more than people think. When you think of the Packers of that time, you immediately think of Lombardi. And in my mind, immediately right after, you think of Bar Star. Seems like a barrel of laughs, though, hanging out with Lombardi, right? I mean, it would be a lot of fun going to a party at Vince Lombardi's house. Back here and stay here. No, I don't get it. My brain problem do you make? The number four quarterback coach duo, Chuck Knoll and Terry Bradshaw. You know, when you get people who are at that high of a level, uh, you know, in sync, it's a truly scary thing for a defense. But they don't have to be in sync. Chuck Knoll and Terry Bradshaw might not have been in sync, but they made beautiful music together. You know, what's that line from Whiplash? The, the worst thing in the world is good enough. 
right? I, who wants to be good enough? Chuck Noll and Terry Bradshaw were also a coach quarterback duo that evolved over time. What resonates most about the, the Noll and Bradshaw duo is that not only do they progressively get better during their time together, they go four for four in the Super Bowl. And I started the whole um, dynasty of the Steeler organization, and it starts with those two. He had in, in Terry Bradshaw, again, this, this raw talent. Chuck Knoll, again, treated Terry Bradshaw the way he needed to be treated. I'm cows and horses and dogs, and he was wine and Russian literature and stuff I have no clue. Bradshaw wasn't an overnight success. Knoll benched him early in his career, and Steelers fans were merciless. Don't read the newspapers because they're going to say bad things about you. Uh... The relationship might have been rocky, but the results were rock solid. Terry did a good job in third down conversions. At the end of the day, I don't know if you have to be friends with the guy, uh, if the guy gets the results. He's got two yards to go on third down, he's going to pass. Terry Bradshaw fires, and it's caught at the 40. And Bradshaw dropping back. And it's a touchdown for Pittsburgh. They went straight down the middle on the bomb. My dad didn't hug me till I went to college, and it worked out great for me. It, it actually didn't. I'm dead inside. Together, Noel and Bradshaw won four Super Bowls in six years, dominating the 70s. They were known as a defensive team. Steel, you know, steel curtain. All right, how are you going to beat that, right? Well, Noel built arguably the greatest defense in NFL history, so that certainly helped Bradshaw get to those Super Bowls. Bradshaw rolling to the right. There after him, he throws on the move into the end zone. And Bradshaw dropping back. Now Bradshaw pumping, firing downfield. There goes Stallworth. He pulls it in at the 30, the 20, the 10, the 5, and it's a touchdown for Pittsburgh. I think that the steel curtain was Julia Roberts to Terry Bradshaw's Lyle Lovett. How about that, huh? The number three quarterback coach duo, Paul Brown and Otto Graham. The best in football. Otto looking for somebody. This one's going to go all the way, running for it. He never gets the due he deserves, ever. Because it was so long ago, people just don't remember it anymore. So here's how old Otto Graham is. His name is Otto Graham. Otto just loved Paul Brown. I mean, he talked about Paul Brown like he was a second father. I guess we're about the worst team that you've ever had. No, you're wrong, Otto. You gave your best out there today. Defeats and setbacks are all a part of growing up. Sometimes we learn more from a defeat than we do from a victory. I think this is the, uh, the, the earliest mold of what everyone else on this list was to become was set here. The dominance that they had over their competition, they win 86% of their games together over a decade. A decade! You know, I believe they're number three on this poll, and that's a very high number but it's not high enough based on what they did. All they did was win. That's how Graham earned the nickname Automatic Auto. No man ever took a team into the final game of the season as many times as he did. 10 seasons together, 10 championship games. The Browns have entered another championship. This one, a cherished conquest in the National Football League. Paul Brown. He didn't care about individual statistics, to who got the most yards, who threw the most passers, or caught the most passes, and that kind of stuff. All he wanted to do was win. Actually, Brown was deeply protective of his players, and even invented a piece of equipment to prove it. Otto Graham had his face uh, cut up, the guy hit him with an elbow when he was down right under my feet in the sideline. Otto suffered a deep facial wound, one that required 15 stitches to close. Paul Brown came up with a great big plastic thing about uh, two inches high, half inch thick. I've heard players say, you're not a football player until you get some of your teeth knocked out. That's idiotic, you know. Who wants your teeth knocked out, you know? That's ridiculous. Graham and Paul Brown, it was a new era of football. Yeah, Paul Brown, he really kind of put the modern 
in the modern era of football. You know, Paul Brown did a lot of stuff that was really groundbreaking, making guys watch film, forming a playbook. Players insert the mimeograph plays, and many hours are spent in study. Paul Brown would talk about revolutionizing the game, the type, the way you run training camp. Fundamentals always a friend. In the 1955 NFL Championship game, Graham threw for two TDs and ran for two more en route to his seventh championship. It was the last game he ever played. His days were completed, Graham leaves the field. And uh, when he got to the sideline, he came over to me and walked up and said, thanks coach. And I said, thank you too, Adam. That's all it was said. The number two quarterback coach duo, Bill Walsh and Joe Montana. Everything has been to perfection. Bill Walsh and Joe Montana is arguably the best example of a quarterback-coach marriage as there is in NFL history. Boy, you got it. You don't get what you want. You'll just throw it, simply throw the ball away. So not there, the way you go. Montana rolling out the right, looking toward the end zone, throwing under pressure, throws his pass, caught by Clark! Clark got a touchdown! This is a duo that together, because of their joint skill set and feel, did perhaps the, one of the greatest jobs of innovating, of changing the game. We never said the words West Coast offense until then. They will rotate past and leave this open or stay inside and leave this open. We've got a hell of a chance. In those early years, guys were open by five yards and nobody knew how. No one was within 10 yards of him. That whole offense was based on, it was all based on timing. And the quarterback steps away from center were part of the timing of the route. Three big, four quick, hitch, 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 throw. You notice the timing on all of these is almost letter perfect. Quarterback, he had to get back at just a certain amount of time. He had to hit that back foot and get ready to throw at just a certain time, because that was when the play was designed for the receiver to get open. He'd look for the ball. The ball had to be there, boom, boom, boom. I mean, it was like a Swiss watch. I think many of the great all-time coaches know what buttons to push with what players. It's part of what makes them stand out on this list. The way that he would needle Joe Montana to get the most out of him every single Sunday. Joe Montana was furious at Bill Walsh in the late 80s when he was taking Joe out of games and putting Steve Young in games. Bill was like, Joe, I'm playing Steve today. No, this is Joe Montana, right? And, and well, I'm gonna put him in, so just know that's coming. Joe had a knife, it would, you know, have been a problem, you know. He could take a player and stretch him right to the breaking point. And then with some humor and wit, he brings them all back together again. You gotta have everybody 100% fresh for this ball game. Somehow you've gotta be fresh. In some cases it may mean a lot of sex, in others none. I don't know. If you grew up in that time period and you watched football, it was literally the gold standard of, of football. And we're gonna kick ass and take no prisoners. In an eight year span, Walsh and Montana won three Super Bowls. Their last, a stunning comeback in Super Bowl 23. 39 seconds remaining. Back to throw Montana. Stepped up, throws. You know, when you think of that 49er dynasty, you those are the two people you think of first. Bill Walsh saw this scrawny kid at a Notre Dame and knew that he could be a champion. I think the perfect marriage of coach, system, and player. And now, the number one quarterback coach duo, Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. I'm not surprised. They've done really well together. Great job. What a win. Great job. It took every second. You damn right. Way to go. That's so happy for football. you. You too. I'm happy for you. I'm going to sound like a total homer, but like, not sure how you don't say Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. Cemented legacies tonight. I mean, yeah. it's just, yeah, there's no, no more debates. I don't have to like it. I respect it. But I ain't got to like it. No, I don't, I don't love Brady and Belichick. I appreciate their contribution to the game. Gosh, they're so good. But as far as like dudes, come on, man. 
No quarterback coach duo is forever linked like Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. To me, the Belichick Brady mix is as high level intellectual academia in the NFL as we've seen. And then you can run him back on a cross across the field if it's like one cover. Right. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. There's not one aspect of football that gets past Bill. Be alert, good speed. Concentrate on what we're doing and be ready for the situation. He knows more about your football team than you do. You can't spend all day on shifting and motion on every play. We're not doing that. And Brady is the perfect on-field uh, general. One minute to go. Throws to the end zone. Catches me. Touchdown. Boy, when you thought you'd seen it all. He understands situational football probably better than anyone in NFL history. They were so out of sync and confused, and Brady knew it. If they both turned out to be robots, I'd be like, yeah, that was robot football. It makes complete sense. You can make a really good case this is the most hated duo on this list. Yeah. Did you like watching Bill Belichick dress like your stepdad when he's doing weeding work? Is that what you like to watch? How about that? On the same day, best dressed and worst dressed, huh? Tom Brady has never eaten spicy salsa, and he's boring. I don't care, that was sweet. The level of dislike nationally from those that are not Patriot fans. A lot of national media people questioning the validity of the Patriots Super Bowl championships. Hey, uh, you win? You're going to draw a lot of haters like that. Is it Bill and Brady executes his system to perfection? Is it Brady and Bill is riding Brady's coattails? Or is it both? Tom Brady, would he have been given even the pure opportunity without Bill Belichick there? Great to see it, Brady. That's the best series you've had in camp. And Bill Belichick, you know, he was a head coach in Cleveland before. Uh, much different circumstance, but nowhere near the same level of success. You know, Brady would have been a successful player with other coaches, and Belichick probably would have been a successful coach with other players, but I don't know if either would be who they are without each other. That's a nice job, champ. Nice job. Nice job. Brady and Belichick get it over Walsh and Montana for longevity. Wait a minute, just, just wait a second. It's what, 11 years compared to 18 years and counting. Since 2001, Belichick and Brady have won 15 division titles, eight conference championships, and are the only quarterback coach duo to capture five Super Bowls. It's another day at the office, kid. I know, buddy. Another day at the office. I think it's a no brainer that these two are number one. I love oh you guys. My God. I love you guys. Love you, baby. You can make great case that each is the all time great as a head coach and as a player. You're the greatest, and you're the greatest. I'm not sure that I can take either one out and put anyone else in and definitively say over that long a span of time they're going to win as much. Best ever. Best ever in my book. 